Aloha and welcome to a Hanakako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent, filling in for Dr. Katie Akina. Um, we work at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, Hawaii's free market think tank. And across the state, farmers and ranchers are wondering what is the future of agriculture in Hawaii? We're here with Paul Brubaker, one of Hawaii's leading economists. Paul was chief economist at the Bank of Hawaii and is now head of TZ Economics or Tropic Zone Economics. Uh, he's the director of the Hawaii Economic Association among uh, many, many other roles. Paul Brubaker recently completed a study called 50 Years of Seed in the 50th State. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Joe. So, well, recently we've seen agriculture in turmoil and a lot of farmers and ranchers are wondering um, what's going on with agriculture um, as the last sugar plantation has just kind of gone belly up in, in Hawaii. So what is going on with uh, agriculture in Hawaii, um, especially when it comes to food production? Well, I think you're right. We should you know, share a moment of silence for this, the sugar industry, which uh, after 170 years, 180 years, is coming to a, a kind of a sad end. Um, but I think it's also instructive that the problem, if you will, that Alexander and Baldwin will face redeploying 30 or 35,000 acres of prime ag land uh, is a challenge faced by the state as a whole, by agriculture in the state. How do you transition out of this plantation legacy and into the other crops and livestock uh, agricultural activities mm -hmm. that will uh, define Hawaii's agricultural future. And speaking of trans, there's a big transition going right now. A lot of people are thinking about, you know, the future of agriculture. It's in the paper a lot, but how much does agriculture make up of the state's entire economy, would you say? Yeah, it's about 0.6% of GDP. A um, hundred years ago, it was 60% of employment. So a hundred years ago, a majority of people in Hawaii worked in agriculture. And that's really a testimony to the amazing productivity of agriculture. Because even U.S. agriculture is only about a percentage point of GDP. Now, wait a second. You, we, are you, you tell me that agriculture is less than 1%, and that's a good thing. Yeah, we feed ourselves. We're overweight. Some people obese and diabetic. And we feed the rest of the world, not to mention throwing away too much food, uh, with less than 1% of GDP. So it's a good thing we don't have to do so much to feed ourselves. Productivity in agriculture has allowed labor and other resources to be redeployed in other economic activities. You recently did a study called uh, 50 Years of Seed in the 50th State, and um, you showed in the study that few agricultural activities in Hawaii's modern history have so profoundly improved human welfare worldwide through contributions to product productivity growth as has Hawaii's corn seed industry. Explain. Yeah, few people realize that 50 years ago, um, plant breeders from across the country were invited out to Hawaii. Literally, Molokai is where everything started as Del Monte Pineapple Plantation closed and those lands became available and began uh, developing corn breeding programs in the winter months. Went up in Iowa and Illinois where a lot of these people were from. It was too cold and they were mm -hmm. hiding out in their laboratories. And that's developed into this seed industry today in which um, you know the maize genome has been uh, evolved by scientists through R&D uh, in an industry that started out with 200 companies and is now five and maybe three in a, in a year or two um, connected globally that is you know there isn't a corn grown commercially uh, on the planet that's not related to something that's been done here in Hawaii over the last half century so the, the mm -hmm. growth in productivity and the maize genome in corn production worldwide is related to what so, we've done here. Again, the same concept of getting more for less work. Yeah, I mean, six or seven times more uh, bushels of corn per acre in the United States than 60 years ago, um, using uh, less agricultural uh, chemical uh, input. Um, a couple of the newer uh, modifications have resulted in reductions of corn insecticide use of up to 90% in the last 15 to 20 years. Well, you're saying that we're using less insecticide because of yeah. uh, seed crops, or the, this correct. new seed technologies and everything. That's correct. And using uh, safer 
uh, herbicides. So the, the, the insecticides uh, have been, insecticide use has been mitigated by alternative approaches to uh, deterring uh, insect uh, infestation mm -hmm. and the um, use of um, herbicides uh, with a, a different genetic application um, has allowed the industry to forego the use of more dangerous chemicals. But there's a history control. here. You said that th this isn't just a new uh, technology. In other words, it's been going on for hundreds of years in a way. Well, so since the dawn of evolution, oh, okay. which in the case of corn, <laughs> yeah. we know is about 9,000 years old. The, the, um, but how come people think it's a new thing then? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. It's kind of like the B science fiction movie version of uh, genetic modification. But, um, you know, uh, when you make a poi dog, you're genetically modifying mm -hmm. the canine, canine uh, genome. So we, right. humans have been doing this for a long time, um, selecting. Uh, the attributes that they want to perpetuate in a crop or a livestock product, and um, and thereby, thereby influencing the evolution of those crops and and, and livestock uh, products. And then nowadays, with the more advanced techniques, taking a more active role in uh, manipulating, uh, you know, at, a, at the molecular level, the instruction set to try to cure human diseases and things of that right. sort. Right. Well, in your report, you also say that, um, well, you cite a study that showed the government has poured more money and support into certain agricultural industries. But when it comes to corn research, uh, this has blossomed with minimal support. Yeah, I mean, the, the foundation was um, a, a land-grant college system, the University of Hawaii, ag researchers there, and the Extension Service that invited the plant breeders to come out uh, from private industry uh, back in the 60s. But from that foundation, which is a, an appropriate foundation, research and development um, in basic science, mm -hmm. um, from that foundation has blossomed an industry that's been fully privately uh, funded and has, uh, you know, kind of taken its own course. Well, what does that say, though? I mean, uh, other industries need more support. This industry of seed uh, technology doesn't need as much support. So what does that say about that industry? So it's, it's always kind of a tough question of how you uh, facilitate economic development. Do you put public resources behind private development or do you uh, create a mechanism or an environment in which private capital or private ideas uh, can thrive on their own? And um, you know that's a tension we're always going back and forth on. But a, a counter example would be um, with the papaya um, is it the ring spot virus, mm -hmm. right? These right. were, there were public investments in R&D that uh, enabled a uh, genetic modification to be developed that, um, you know, like vaccinating against the virus kept the um, papaya industry from collapsing. So, so there now may we be have safer food in that area rather than having a food with a virus, we have a food that can withstand it? Well, in that case, uh, the, the virus, you know, sort of like the uh, oh rapid Ohio death, right? Mm -hmm. your, your choices are wipe out the entire Ohio forest, wipe out all papaya production, or, um, you know, inoculate the papaya and genetically. And it saved the industry, too. It did save the industry. Wow. And so, but what I'm saying is that the when the government uh, pours money and research into uh, certain industries, that, that's almost like a, a flag or an indicator of, um, I guess, future uh, viability or... Well, or not. I mean, yeah. very, very often the government is being called upon by special interest groups and so on to pour public resources into an industry to help support it when it's having trouble uh, maintaining its commercial viability. There is that flip side where the government pours resources into developing, say, an infrastructure like the Internet that will allow private capital to flourish. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, it's, it's, it's always a tough sort of attention. Um, I, you know, economists tend to um, look skeptically, skeptically on the idea of omniscient governments picking winners. Um, we tend to prefer mechanisms that allow private entrepreneurship and innovation uh, and, uh, and investment to uh, channel the outcomes into uh, commercially viable, profitable, and socially beneficial, so, beneficial uh, outcomes. So when it comes to agriculture then, the future of agriculture in Hawaii, what can the government do? What should the government do if we want to have a, uh, a blossoming industry? Here, uh, blossoming, no pun intended. <laughs> so here's a, um, because, you know, cut florals are a big part of industry that aren't food, uh, ag industry that aren't food. Um, I liken it to, you know, here we are on Think Tech Hawaii, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, think of agriculture as the world's original venture capital industry. Private investors place their bets on a crop, put their money literally into the ground, and wait to see if something comes out, blossoms in the future. And it might not. And it might not. And it might get right to harvest, and then here comes the hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's a risky business. And uh, so the kinds of things government can do is help to ensure against some of those risk exposures or provide a mechanism for private insurance to uh, provide coverage. Um, one of the things I would say is create an environment, so to speak, wherein ag entrepreneurs and investors are assured that they can grow the crops that they want to grow and not have to get the community's permission all the time. I mean, that's, to me, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that um, troubles me is this idea that, you know, I have a house on an ag subdivision next to your farm, and now I'm going to tell you what you can and can't grow. It's like I moved next to the airport, and I'm going to tell the airport not to take planes, uh, when not an to take off and land planes. When an entrepreneur can actually plan for the future without a lot of uh, variables, and, and is someone going to yeah. um, take my property either through force or through regulation, then they can uh, plan for a, a business, and they can actually... You know. Go government can actually do a lot to assure farmers and the community generally that if it's on ag land and it's legitimate agricultural activity, you're good to go. Uh, Governor Ige recently pledged to double food production in the next 13 years. It's a laudable goal. Um, and I'm just wondering, is this even possible, though, you know, with the, the losses we've seen in agriculture in Hawaii? Um, it, a lot of people are scared. So yeah. what, what would the government then have to do to reach that goal? Well, I guess first we should ask, is it possible? It's definitely feasible. I mean, when Oahu Sugar, as an example, when Oahu Sugar shut down uh, in the 1990s on Oahu, 10,000 acres of prime ag land and the Eva Plain up in Cuneo, Cunea were um, released. Mm -hmm. And two farmers, Larry Jeffs and Alex Sue, went in and loomed farms. And I can't remember what Larry's farm is called, but they're farming in roughly two 5,000 acre um, right. areas uh, so successfully. You never know. So you never know. Well, but um, the, you know, the trick with those guys is here they're on an island with a million people and more tourists or half a million households. So it's possible on Oahu to scale that kind of activity. A little tougher on the neighbor islands, which have smaller markets, maybe 200,000, you know, on uh, Maui mm -hmm. and... Uh, and on the big island, so there's a you know you have a shot at it there if you want to scale production. Plenty of ag land, and of course, as uh, Hawaii Commercial and Sugar closes this year, uh, even more land on on Maui. So there's definitely right. some you know upside potential there. So with every loss, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. I think it's important to that we think about commercial viability as the guideline by which we you know measure success, rather than um, some other metric that may be uh, you know more squishy. Well, we're going to talk about some of those opportunities uh, after the break. Okay. I'm here with the economist Paul Brubaker, uh, back in a minute on a Hanukkah call. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, Viva Health Coach. Viva la comida saludable. Hi, my name is Justini Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m., we host the Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. This is the place you can come to for insight on the perspective and history and passions of Hawaii's farmers and all folks involved in Hawaii's local food system. What kind of folks do we have on? So we have everyone from local farmers, we have foodies, chefs, we also have journalists, uh, researchers, anyone who's actually working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So join us every Thursday and uh, tweet into us and ask us some questions and leave your comments as well. Welcome back to Ehana Kako. I'm Joe Kent filling in for Dr. Kelly Akina. We're here with economist Paul Brubaker. Um, on Maui, we just ended with, uh, there's an opportunity for growth. Um, 
the last sugarcane plantation has now um, evaporated, it looks like. And Winding now down, Now we yeah. have a lot of fallow, fallow fields there. Mm -hmm. Some people see fallow fields as a bad thing. Others see it as a good thing, uh, depending on your, half your outlook. Half full, half empty. <laughs> half full. Exactly. And I want to ask you then, um, when it comes to just the different industries across Hawaii um, and their economic viability, uh, what do you see as um, most viable? Sure. Right? If you if you think about what has been successful as sugar and pineapple, sugar cane and pineapple have wound down over the last 30 years or so, um, it's a, been a diverse mix of uh, agricultural activities, um, you know, ranging from livestock and aquaculture, which is up and coming, um, to um, some food products. Uh, you know, the the, the uh, fresh fruit and vegetable market. Uh, has always been uh, an active one in import substitution in those areas, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an area of opportunity. But in addition, it's important to remember that agriculture, not to mention the seed industry, which is now about a quarter of all agriculture in Hawaii, but cut florals and mm -hmm. ornamentals. And we have a, a slide uh, on this called a it's titled A Global Commodity Pricing Supercycle Unwinds. <laughs> what a great yeah. title for a slide. <laughs> well, it's, I made it for another okay. uh, purpose, but yes, there, we've had an unwinding in global commodity prices, including corn, other grains, uh, uh, energy commodities, uh, mm -hmm. metals and minerals. And that's taken the seed industry, the derived demand for the seed and for the R&D activity downward. Okay, oh. but we, so we can see in that, that yellow line is the seed industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're saying it went downward recently. It, it, it's a big downward adjustment. And because then, of course, you could, well, the decline in like, the price of a bushel of corn went from $7 a bushel to three fifty. Aha. Uh -huh. So, okay. you know, a, a reduction in the uh, price of corn means the fewer farmers want to grow it. Uh, the reduction in the prices of oil and other energy commodities meant that the demand coming from corn as a biofuel oil is uh, tied to down. corn. Then uh, the oil is tied to corn, and because the price of sugar went down, mm -hmm. uh, the demand for corn sweeteners came down. So the demand for corn seed, like the demand for fertilizer or land or labor and whatnot, is derived from the, the final product. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the demand for R and D activity in in corn. Okay. Uh, is derived demand. And compared to the seed industry um, on that uh, global, <coughs> global, global commodity pricing slide, um, yeah. there are other, you, you see, I see aquaculture in yeah, there Yeah, aquaculture well. is kind of an up-and-coming uh, area. You can just sort of make it out there at the, at the right end of the, of the trajectory. The backdrop, you can see the great heyday of sugar cane in the 1960s and 70s and the, the, the slow uh, decline uh, in the backdrop. But um, all of these other, I mean, there's room for everybody. You know, there's room for the nuts, there's room for the fruits, there's room for the cattle, there's room. I mean, it's, it's kind of nothing but upside. The amount of cultivated acreage in Hawaii has decreased from about 250, 275,000 acres 30 years ago to only about 55,000 today. So that's, even if you were just looking at the best land that was already in cultivation 20, 30 years ago, there's hundreds of thousands of acres already available, even before uh, A and B shuts down HCNS on so Maui. So what's the, what's the hold up then? Well, we commercial viability. I mean, the, your competition as a farmer is all the globally sourced food that the miracles of modern transportation logistics and supply chain management make available to us on a daily basis. You can get fresh strawberries on Maui, on Oahu, every day of the year. Yeah, think about that for a second. Imported. Fresh strawberries, yeah, imported on airplanes. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And, uh, and it's a good thing. It means we have fresh strawberries every day. Mm -hmm. um, now, when we talk about uh, food sustainability, some people say that uh, you know we grow 10% of the food sure. uh, is cons is uh, that's grown here is is consumed here, and people would like 100% of the food that's grown here to be consumed here. Yeah, but that, um, that's a little like saying. I'd like 100% of the smartphones used in Hawaii to be made in Hawaii. I mean, really? <laughs> in we other words, to that because what? In other words, why? Yeah, why would you do that? I mean. So, I'm an economist, so when you learn the economic secret handshake, right, you, you realize that if something is not commercially viable, it doesn't pay for itself, it's probably not worth doing. If you can come up for another reason for doing it, sort of national defense, does national defense pay for itself? Well, consider the alternative, right? So we engage in some collective activities that are designed to 
provide us with services that the private sector probably wouldn't do. But food's not one of them. And my guess is if we create an environment in which agricultural entrepreneurs and innovators can go out there and take advantage of these released ag mm -hmm. lands and the infrastructure that's available, irrigation and whatnot. There's um, nothing wrong with growing food. Nothing wrong with growing food. I, you know, I'm, I'm down with all of the above. Organic, mm -hmm. conventional, mm -hmm. big farm, small farm, farmer's market, supermarket, you yeah. know, it's all good. But it just si seems so sad to think that we've got um, some of our food, food leaving the state and instead we're importing food that wasn't grown here. I mean, there's just sort of an emo I mean, isn't there some yeah, sort no, of I'm emotional sad, argument yeah, no, there? Sadness, that's not what that's comes not to my mind. No, I mean, I'm happy to find, I'm happy to, you know, eat, uh, you know, to drink French wine or Australian uh, wine and uh, hopefully someday we can send them some of our papayas. It's a good thing. That we can import. It's good both directions, imports mm -hmm. and exports. The more, the better. And we don't just export food, though. We uh, export uh, tourism in a well, way that's too. Well, that's yes. So yeah. we specialize in tour in the production of tourism-related goods and services, mostly services. Mm -hmm. And we earn our external receipts, our foreign income, our export income, in that area, which enriches us to the point where we can afford to buy our food from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing, you, you mentioned sustainability, that's a mm -hmm. slightly different thing, okay. which is about, you know, sort of responsible resource okay. stewardship, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I think the aspiration to self-sufficiency is probably misdirected. Um, we are an interdependent economy, and that's the reason why we have the high standards of living that we do, because of the interdependence. We can share with, uh, with others and we can... Um, well, I, I would have said that a couple of years ago, but now sharing means Uber or some oh. Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. So I, it's not the sharing the shared economy. economy. <laughs> it's just the economy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And speaking of uh, the economy, um, yeah. especially when it comes to agriculture, you have kind of a history in... Well, you're an economist, but uh, your, your family was part of the agriculture community. Yeah, but so my grandfather was a... a Plant breeder, got his PhD in genetics in the Cretaceous era in 1926. My dad was a plant breeder and he was active with the seed industry uh, from the beginning. Um, and I got out of it because my cousin became a plant breeder, so I got to be an economist. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like a lot of, a lot of families in Hawaii. Um, many of us have roots in agriculture, however, you know, however distant and uh, remote now, a couple generations later. But, uh, and it is a different world, you know. Uh, even when I was a kid, most, you know, you knew somebody who grew up on a farm or maybe your parents grew up on a farm, as was the case in my family. Um, now, most people think that food comes from the supermarket, you know. They don't, they <laughs> well, people want to get back to the farm, though. I mean, yeah, they but want the, the idea, their idea is a different idea from getting up at dawn every morning and working out in the field all day. They're, they're thinking of the guy driving in the John Deere tractor with the GPS changing the, the nutrient admixture as they drive across the field plowing 20 rows at a time. That's, yeah. That's People rom romanticize. Um, a, a little bit. We tend to romanticize everything, but yeah, that's, you know, Hanabara days, wasn't it better back in the day? Yeah, some things were, but uh, yeah, <laughs> well, starvation wasn't. <laughs> when it comes to uh, agriculture on Maui, though, all, all eyes are on Maui right now as we um, see what's going to be grown in those fallow fields. What, well, what would you predict, or what would you kind of uh, guess would be yeah. the best thing for them to, to try? Oh, I, to I have no presupposition about oh, okay. what's going to work. Yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm pretty sure A and B knows what they're doing, and yeah. and I imagine a fair amount of it will involve ag leasing to okay. people who make a pitch to them. Mm -hmm. Hey, I think I can grow this and make some money doing it. Can I, you know, can we get a lease to use some of this land? Because coming up with a look, if they if they had a brilliant idea, they probably would have come up with it already. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to be optimistic because you can look at West Maui where the plantations closed down a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's tough. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres over the, uh, over the last couple of decades. At the same time, I'm a proponent of preserving ag land for the following reason. You don't know what crops in the future are going to be either commercially viable or make a contribution to no the production one can of global. Know. Nobody yeah. could possibly know what kind of crop, but if you pave over that land, you'll never be able to exercise that option. You may wake up 20 years from now and realize, wow, we can grow the cure for cancer, except, oops, we built a subdivision. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm a big favor of keep the country country and make the city city, 
Mm -hmm. Those are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. You can have both, and you know. What about though the idea that um, because you know agriculture is so expensive to uh, to try to compete uh, with other other places? No and, question about it. And Hawaii, a part of that cost is housing. And so, yeah. you know, don't we need more houses in Hawaii to try to pay for the labor that's living in those houses to actually work? On, someone's got to work on the farm. Look, I don't want to presuppose the outcome on Maui, but let's face right. it. If 30,000 acres of flat ag land on the edge of the Kahului Wailuku conurbation can be redeployed in urban uses, mm -hmm. I mean, you could, you'd only have to carve out a small part of it to satisfy housing need there and still preserve tens of thousands of acres of ag land. Or to try to keep the city city and try to, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of Absolutely. different options if we're talking uh, about... There, there are many options, and, I, and again, I think commercial viability is a good way to sort of organize your thinking about it. But I'll, I'll also say that preservation is important because you need to keep your options open. Okay. Now, when it comes to the rest of this day, you were just on uh, Kauai, Big Island, Oahu. What do you see um, when it comes to talking, you're talking to... Yeah, sure. Every, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like the tourism, right? Every island offers a slightly different destination experience, and every island also has a slightly different history, uh, both in terms of uh, success and demise of agriculture, uh, and in terms of, the, 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 you know, the resource endowment. Um, so Big Island, just say, you know, it's Big Island. All the other islands fit into the Big Island with land left over. So you can do something like ranching. Mm -hmm. um, as you can on, on, uh, on Maui. Um, but if the, the pattern that you see with a lot of Hawaii crops and livestock activities, activities is something that's really a niche product that can extract value from a particular attribute, a particular characteristic that's unique to a particular island or an island environment, microclimate that may be in one place or another, or in the case of the intellectual property associated with the development of the maize genome mm -hmm. in something that literally you've created, applying science uh, to, uh, you know, through agronomy uh, to get a better widget. Right. And, uh, all, and, you know, all things are possible. Who knows what's going to happen with, you know, ocean fishing, I mean, these, f these, they, they put these aquaculture, soft, right. Oat, Fish farms are, you know, I, I keep hearing about this stuff. That right. thing's taking off right now. Well, and not to mention the, the Made in Hawaii sticker that everybody seems yeah, to have. Yeah, well, so. <laughs> while, while that's still good to go, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? While people still, you know, we can still fake people yeah. into thinking that's a good thing. No, I mean, we've got a number yeah. of great, great uh, brands, the, you know, mm -hmm. the Kona Coffee brand, uh, for example. People still associate Hawaii with both pineapple and sugar, C and H. Really? Yeah. Are they going to change their name? I don't think so. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show and helping to educate us about agriculture. My Hawaii. pleasure, Joe. Uh, and uh, thanks, we'll have you on any time here. So. Wow.